concerned about elephants and other wildlife. The group is a forum for disseminating knowledge linked to elephants and other wildlife science, conservation, and welfare through art, culture, literature, movies, talks, and panel discussions. Our expectation is that people who attend our events conducted remotely now um, on their own or with the uh, proximity to people from policy making help in developing appropriate conservation and welfare measures for wildlife, including elephants. The schedule for today is uh, as follows. We will have an introduction by my colleague uh, Sanjay Ajnikar, followed by um, a talk on wandering in elephant being artistic inquiries to find ourselves in relationship by uh, Shivi Kalyan. This will be followed by another conversation um, between Bindu Malini and Ramna Chandra Shekhar in conversation with Shivi Kalyan on can art help us to kindle the ways of connecting and finding ourselves in relationship with the elephant. Finally, uh, we will have a question and answer session with our esteemed guests, which will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Ankur. We shall now um, move on to um, introduction by Sanjay, Arts and Elephants, Conservation Through Campus. Over to you, Sanjay. Sanjay, I think you're muted. Thank you so much for the information. So at times it's <clears throat> become weird to talk to the screen, but you know uh, we have to follow certain protocols, which are set by Anusha rightly. She told about <laughs> the house tweets. So, uh, but very good evening to everyone. I'm glad that I'm audible and uh, visible too. So, a uh, very interesting topic that we have today is con conservation through canvas. So, uh, let me take a step back and understand. You know what we are talking about. We are talking about the art, we are talking about how to use the art for conservation. So what, what is the art, you know? Uh, I, I don't have to explain, I don't have to define, everyone is aware what is art. But if I would just say what are the quick words which comes in my mind when I say art, the colors, the designs, the symmetry. I remember my father forcefully uh, making me sit with my brother in the art class or painting class where he had been asked to draw you know, uh, some kind of flower for 50 times, just so that the symmetry can come right. And there is a symmetry, you know, there's a symmetry in everywhere that you look at, and that's art. Uh, I wouldn't say coincidentally, but uh, functionally, there's a symmetry in the nature also. Colors are there in, some, you know, in the nature. Uh, there is an engineering in the nature that we see, you know, we see that elephants are also engineers of the forest. You know because they help in a lot of way to engineer the forest. So there is a color, there's a design, there's a symmetry in the nature, likewise in the art. So there are few forms of arts which has, which follow the symmetry. There are few forms of art which may or may not follow the symmetry or design. So let's understand this from our esteemed speakers today, uh, which uh, you know, Anusha will introduce in a while. Uh, another aspect that we would like to understand from them is what, what is art, you know? What, what are those expressions? What are those feelings? What are the emotions? So if it would not have been a pandemic, we would be sitting in an auditorium. We may be experiencing those art forms, uh, you know, in person, face to face. And then we would have related those forms after experiencing that how we can use those forms for the conservation. Unfortunately, we are on online, but the, the brilliant part is, we have a speakers who come from the work of art and science, and we would like to understand from them, from their experiences, and let's hear from them what they think about artists in very, very, uh, I would say, in a very experienced way, or even they'll help us to visualize that. The second part, you know, when I talk about the visualization, when I talk about the using art, you know, so the very, very, uh, uh, I would say the great association comes with the joy, with the expressions, with the emotions, a different kind of emotions, could be happy emotions, could be a sad emotion. Yesterday I was listening to one of the channel of uh, classical 
uh, a singer, a Maharashtrian classical singer named Rahul Deshpande. He was quoting Suresh Wadkar. So he was exploring what Suresh Wadkar has sung. You know, I'm sure many of you would be aware of Suresh Wadkar. He is a classical singer as well as a playback singer. And he was talking about that whenever he listens to that composition, which he was trying to explore yesterday on the YouTube channel, uh, he quoted that he always get that happiness. So that's that's expression which art, certain form of art gives us. So what is this ha happiness? So it can be explained scientifically that it's some kind of biochemical, uh, you know, which are getting released, utilized by nervous system, and then there is science behind it. But do we need to understand these? And that's that's how I would again uh, go back to our esteemed speakers and let them talk about it. That how how to decode this, and then once we understand them, how to use it for the conservation. I remember another example. You know, uh, uh, for the uh, you know, I don't want to take a lot of time, so I'm just rushing through. I remember another very interesting example. There's a designer, American designer. Uh, she's into illustration. She designed various established logos and uh, she actually uh, designed the maps, the city maps uh, in New York. Okay? And you, she's a painter and illustrator. So she designed these huge uh, wall size maps you know, where she was using ladder and paints to actually draw those maps. And what is interesting thing she put it, you know, as for the areas, the area is popular for a zoo. She had some kind of color codes for zoo. The area is popular for some uh, uh, civil offices, government offices, she used, it, used another color code. When it is a lot of greenery, she used another color code. So it's full of different colors, you know. So that's artists putting something in a scientific manner, in a very engineer manner. And that's how it is used and it has been preserved and uh, uh, enjoyed and cherished by a lot of people who would find maps very complex and dry. And she could bring it to life by using different colors, different themes. And then if I had to take it to conservation, and this is absolutely hypothetical, I would say that if I travel a lot by train, and I'm sure, you know, uh, all of you are there on, you know, joining today, could be, you know, traveling by road or train, and you're aware of certain geographies, certain areas. And imagine somebody draw these maps, you know, and you visit those maps after 10 years, and you find that there was a lot of greenery, someone used a green color, and after decade, it has been become gray or maybe maroon because that represent, uh, you know, civil officers, that represent a lot of engineered space, you know. So how do we feel about that? You know, do we not feel pinched that, oh, where is the greenery gone? Or where is the river is gone, which I could see 10 years back. Mm -hmm. That happens when I go back to my hometown, that river has become like a stream, you know. So then how do we use the art, those emotions, which are around the art, uh, those feelings and certain designs, you know, how to take it forward for the cause of conservation. And this, this is how I would introduce today's topic. And I would, uh, you know, request Anusha to take it forward and introduce our, uh, you know, our speakers. And I'm very excited to uh, listen to them, uh, what, what they would uh, talk about today. Anusha, would you please take it forward? Right. Um, thanks, Sanjay. So we will move on with uh, the main event today. Uh, we will begin with the talk by uh, Shri Kalyan on uh, wandering in elephant being, artistic inquiries to find ourselves in relationship. Before I hand it over, I would like to quickly introduce uh, Madam. Uh, Srivi Kalyan is an artist, designer, educator, writer, and research scholar. She has authored and illustrated several books for children and adults and is an award-winning writer and illustrator. She's worked for some of the leading educational entertainment organizations designing cutting-edge books and media for children and young people. In addition to being the dean of uh, Srishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design, and Technology, she is also the Associate Dean for the School of Law, Environment and Planning. Shrivi brings transdisciplinary um, approaches and insights to her work. She is founder, director of Funi Ferris. Mom, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing it right. And her personal work can be viewed on the links that are present on the screen. Over to you, ma'am. Could 
Could I share your, ma'am, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Anusha and Sanjay. Uh, can you share mine? Because I still don't have rights to. So, okay, I'll do that right away. Or if I can be given rights because I have an additional slide that I would like to share. Okay, I'm just, yeah, I'm actually on, on it. Yeah, thank so, you. But, yeah. Meanwhile, um, I'll just continue the conversation. Sanjay, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I hope uh, we can do some justice to many of the questions and key points that you have raised uh, in your introduction. Um, just holding one second. Okay, I'll go with this. Uh, just give me a minute to... Um, so uh, just to sort of introduce uh, the talk, uh, I've been working on my um, uh, doctoral work, which looks at porosity as a principle of consciousness. And uh, when I say porosity, I'm really looking at, uh, is, is it such a stark boundary that defines who we are as human beings? Uh, are we limited by our bodies? Are we limited by our minds? Uh, or is there a much more fluid principle that connects us? Uh, and it is uh, on that ground that um, I began inquiring about five, six years ago, um, much of my lived experience with nature uh, in which I could feel and experience landscape in a porous manner. I could uh, sometimes experience the feeling of different species. Um, and uh, oftentimes it would become very difficult to differentiate who was going through the experience. Um, so I wanted to see if there was a way in which I could articulate some of these seemingly um, you know, uh, intangible and mystical experiences that many of us go through in the natural world. Uh, we often don't give words to it. Uh, we uh, often don't talk about it. But uh, what if we did talk about it? And being in the arts, it, gives me, it gave me the space to explore uh, what it meant to be uh, in this kind of an inquiry. So I'm going to look at this uh, porosity as a principle and uh, working with elephant memories, um, I mean, uh, working with uh, my memories of elephants, uh, working with paintings of elephants and connecting um, these sort of intangible and subtle experiences. Um, I'll come back later to the question of what value it might have for conservation uh, and, uh, or conservation education in both uh, cases, but uh, this is really the premise from where I'm working. So let me just see if I'm able to share mine now. Um, can you stop the sharing? I'll try to share from mine. Okay, where is this? Um, so what I just explained, um, how do we move away from that point of disconnection that we have with the natural world and move into a more uh, sort of an ancient way of being, uh, which we still find in Aboriginal tribal cultures, we still find people able to intrinsically connect with the natural world in this manner. So how do we go into that? Um, so I'm going to start uh, with poetry because I think uh, a large part of my work happens through poetry and both reading of poetry and writing of poetry. So uh, one of my favorite uh, poets, Bharadiyar, and it is uh, his centenary year. Uh, um, so I would like to start with that. Um, and I, I also feel like a lot of our intrinsic connections are with our own languages. And sometimes when we draw upon um, our relationship with the natural world from our, pers I mean, our native language, then we find new doors opening uh, in that framework. So uh, one of his poems, Vanil Parakin Repulle Lamnan, is really uh, the song of myself. And he says, I am all the birds that fly in the sky. I am all the beasts that roam the earth. I am all the trees that grow in the woods. I am the wind, the rain, and the sea. I am all the stars that shine on high. I'm the vast expanse of widening space. I'm all the worms that crawl on earth. I'm all the life in the vasty deep. Um, and to me, this is sort of the essence uh, of where I'm coming from into saying, is there a way we can experience nature in and through ourselves and as uh, ourselves? Uh, so the painting that you see, uh, while it does not have an elephant in particular here, 
Um, it's drawn to uh, this whole interconnected relationship that we share with the natural world and the possibility of allowing porous experiences to happen to us. Um, and the key framework that I use is interiority and exteriority. And can we listen and feel from within? Is there a way that we can engage uh, by drawing from within ourselves to relate rather than um, the exterior frame that has become since the industrial revolution, since the uh, sort of um, um, uh, last almost 200 to 300 years, we have been talking exteriority a lot and somewhere we have lost this language of interiority and how it connects us to the real world and what is the relationship between us and uh, whatever we call as real and how do we redefine this? So um, I start with this uh, sort of poetic question. Can you walk in elephant heart, elephant joy, grief and elephant drought? Can you walk in elephant fear, elephant anxiety and elephant love? Can you walk in elephant gentleness and stand hidden in stillness? So this is uh, from a moment uh, of experience in uh, Bandipur. It was monsoon. Uh, it was the first shower of monsoon uh, when we were driving through. And um, there was a moment when literally earth, sky and beings were all in a single flow. Um, and uh, when I came back, I wanted to capture that experience uh, of seeing elephant and cheetal um, in the rain. And, uh, it's again like uh, there are a lot of uh, inquiries I've gone through in terms of form, which we will discuss as we go through. But this this particular experience comes from a moment in Bandipur of seeing this tusker, uh, seeing Cheetal sitting. Uh, there's a complete stillness and calmness to their being, uh, even as the rain is pouring and uh, the the whole earth seemed to have shifted into song. And um, and yet there was a complete silence that um, uh, was underlying that song that was happening. Uh, so I have used very uh, limited color and largely black ink uh, and a little bit of pastel pencil uh, to sort of keep it, keep uh, to bring out that sense of silence that I experienced while uh, having the song and shower uh, of rain that came together. Um, this is uh, a more recent painting I did after uh, um, I, uh, spoke about the talk with uh, Surindra Verma and others, and um, I was uh, I had not worked a lot with elephant uh, images or elephant paintings before, and uh, I wanted to create a set of new images for this talk and to say what are some more ways of experiencing that I have encountered or visions that I have encountered. So uh, this one is um, dreaming an elephant being. And somewhere I feel like when we are uh, very quiet within ourselves, like most of the time we are talking, talking, talking in our heads also. There's not, there is no silence within us. But when we are still and silent, we are able to experience another being. And uh, this was a sort of, um, uh, how do I interpret that experience of dreaming an elephant being? Um, so it's a moment of sleeping, but it's also a moment where it feels like the elephant is part of your consciousness. It's not distinct and separate from your consciousness. Um, this one is elephants playing in the lotus pond, also a new painting that I did in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, so there's a very beautiful painting uh, from the Elora caves and you can, you can look it up perhaps later. And um, I was very inspired by how um, gently they had captured the elephant and it is of elephants playing in the lotus pond. Um, I have here taken uh, the, the basic motif and the imagery from that painting and combined it with uh, another uh, beautiful painting, I mean a uh, collection of paintings uh, that I saw in the Siddhanavasal caves near Pudukote. And uh, again uh, it was a lotus pond and monks elephants fish um, and other creatures were part of this uh, uh, and it, it's a ceiling painting. Uh, so I wanted to combine these elements and I felt that uh, just the simple pleasure of watching the elephant enjoying itself um, and not studying the elephant in any other manner but just looking at the elephant and saying hey it's having fun. Um, and uh, 
something very poignant about it being a lotus pond and uh, the fact that in Indian thought, um, both the elephant and uh, the lotus are um, considered uh, very highly evolved uh, and uh, metaphors of um, uh, sort of an evolved consciousness and evolved uh, uh, um, sort of ability to experience and be in the world, a sense of being. And uh, I wanted to bring those two together uh, to sort of recreate the magic of what it means to just look at play uh, in the life of another species. Um, then this is um, um, from another uh, uh, set of memories, again from Bandipur, and uh, uh, I'm just calling it gentle footsteps and sitting by the Moyar Gorge. Uh, for me, this was a very poignant experience. I did not see any elephants here. We were just sitting there for about 15 or 20 minutes um, by the uh, gorge uh, on the Bandipur side and just observing the landscape. Uh, there was nothing else uh, there. It was, it was about observing the landscape and hearing some of the conservation issues and the conflicts uh, of these spaces, which is uh, largely elephant corridors. And, uh, and at that point, um, while there is no elephant, you can sense elephant being there. You can sense the uh, footsteps and the, it, it, it almost feels like the landscape holds the memory of the, uh, of the elephants that have walked on it, uh, of the elephants that traverse that path. And there is an, um, a relationship, a network that's, that is not visible to the naked eye, but is still there. Um, and to me, that, that magic, how does one inquire into this sort of um, what the land and uh, the being share with each other, what a land and any species that we may take to draw or um, um, study, how, what is the relationship that they share that we don't talk of? And how do we um, sort of unravel these relationships? That uh, became an essential question. So uh, um, again, questioning through poetry. Can you walk in conflicted lands and draw upon the energy of other beings? Can you walk in their footsteps and hold their memories with gentleness? What shifts, what changes when you find yourself in them? So uh, this is from a children's book that I had illustrated. Um, I've called it Tasting Sweetness. The children's book looked at the, uh, a Baiga girl and a city boy interacting and looking at issues of poaching. Um, so it's written by Vital Rajan and he himself had lived uh, as a young boy um, in Madhya Pradesh and he was familiar with the Baiga tribes. So he wrote from his lived experience. Um, so it's a beautiful story um, published by Zuban Books and uh, it's available in the market. So I had looked at um, a lot of, I mean, uh, my illustrations had scenes from the story and it also had uh, varied species uh, that belonged to that landscape, um, both uh, flora and fauna. So uh, this is a drawing from uh, that children's book. Uh, then this is a sort of a very quick um, imagination of a mother and child uh, and, a, and a moment and I said, what if we were listening into this mother and child conversation uh, and not um, thinking of only the human frame? And if we are, um, you know, like a, dis a moment when the mother is present, but she's also a little distracted, a little uh, sort of in a space where she's wondering and looking at the safety, the child is all engrossed um, and wants to play. And, and we experience this with, uh, uh, with our own, uh, kids, we experience it with young children everywhere, and uh, it's not very different when you're observing it in the wild either. Um, so this sort of uh, skirmish and um, poignant gentleness that exists between mother and child. So it was just a quick sketch, uh, not even a finished painting. Um, this is, uh, as I said, uh, sitting by the Moyar Gorge, while this is not a depiction of that landscape in particular. Um, I wanted to look at whispers of elephant presence. It is uh, not often that you uh, sight an elephant when you go. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Uh, but you still feel the presence of this magnificent uh, being in the forest. Uh, and um, 
how does one then interpret that visually? Um, I didn't want it to be too loud a painting. I wanted it to be subtle and uh, sort of capture this, um, the presence of the elephant almost fading into the mountains, fading into the landscape, but still there. So the mountains and the rivers, the salt trees and the flame of the forest, hard ground and tall grass, sugarcane fields and endless bamboo. They all have memories of elephants passing by, touching, holding, trampling, walking, gathering, and being. Again, a new painting that I did uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, this one is part of a bigger painting. So what you see here is, uh, in, the, in the next slide, I'll show the full painting. So uh, the forest has been uh, a fascinating uh, experience at any point of time when you go in and uh, it's, it moves you with its beauty, its famine, its terror, uh, and its wonder. Uh, you, it, it's just moving to be in that space and it mellows the heart in so many different ways. So um, for me, this whole thing is that we cannot separate the habitat and the species at any given point of time. But how do we capture this interrelationship in art and how do we make it visible uh, both in uh, sort of educational experiences, artistic training, as well as in one's own creative practice. Uh, so who walks, who flies, who wanders, who sleeps, who shifts their roots gently, sighing, breathing in and out? Who, who is this strange being, this forest? Um, so this is part of a larger painting um, where you can uh, see the elephant right here. It's a combination of several landscapes. Once again, the central um, um, piece is a banyan tree from uh, ficus uh, from Bandipur. Um, and some of the uh, parts of the landscape are from Bandipur, parts are from Bangalore, and parts are from Chandigarh, uh, the Sukna Lake. Um, and there, there is a, uh, I've called it nigilchi, which is a Tamil word to talk about this feeling of melting that one goes through. Um, and uh, this, is, this was uh, an acrylic painting, uh, which I had tried to find form for this innumerable set of moments of uh, feeling uh, completely lost into the environment, completely drawn into the environment. And how does one capture these multiple experiences in a single frame? Uh, mm -hmm. So there are several of my notes. I'm not going to read all of it, um, but just to give you a sense, um, Somewhere along the curve, further away from the roads, a ficus stands in the fields adjoining the forest. In a self-contained circle, she rules the landscape with simple, elegant ease. I'm mesmerized when I watch her and wonder what made her fashion herself like that. The hanging roots are in varying lengths, but they appear like rain, like waterfall. The rhythmic song that seems to be the form of this tree is reminiscent of water. I'm drawn to it like I'm drawn to the rain catcher. It rises in perfect cylindrical geometry and yet breaks that in the organic flow of its branches and roots, of its million leaves dancing in the wind. This tree is song, but of such extraordinary stillness that she appears to anchor all the land around her as well as the sky. And just as she anchors them all, she finds a way to draw me in too. Even as I have always wondered about the architecture of trees, this time when I look at this particular ficus tree, I get the feeling perhaps an insight that these fine beings are extraordinarily conscious of their own form and craft themselves diligently. In trees, I begin to sense a nature of consciousness that as humans, we have no clue about and no tools to measure. But I would hedge my bet on the trees and I bet that it wasn't just land, sun, water and other resources that shaped her form, but a conscious process by which the tree crafted herself in that space. Elephants saunter, take their time, graze, stand still, wave their trunks in quiet relish, alone, in a hurt, hidden from direct gaze. Cheetal, alert yet audacious, playful and watchful, the moments are too gentle. This time and space is also hidden to our loud selves. Only in our, one's own inner quietness does the landscape reveal itself. Um, so I think somewhere, uh, you know, going back to what uh, Sanjay initially introduced, I think there is a lot of, um, uh, in art, you are allowed to express your feeling, you're allowed to talk about the emotion. It's not about um, factual data that 
we are collecting, but it's also about experiences and emotions and how we experience something and how do we articulate those experiences. And I think that space uh, gives us different ways to engage um, and a different way of thinking about conservation in the future. So I want to leave this out. Um, this is another uh, painting that I had done uh, for my friends. And uh, you'll see here, uh, there is the elephant. Did I miss a slide? Yeah, there's a close-up of the elephant. Um, and once again, this, this whole thing of, it's an interconnected space. You cannot think of the elephant without thinking of the entire forest and the interconnections in the forest. Uh, and many times I think uh, when we start taking interest in one species, we somehow forget that it's uh, the entirety of the landscape um, and the co-evolution of all the beings in that landscape that we need to consider. And how do we think about uh, and experience that sort of relationship that is there in the forest? So uh, this is a pen and ink work based on that. Um, this is another work um, which I had created uh, based on uh, the documentary films of Shekhar Dadadri. And um, it is tied, the composition is tied by a river that flows all the way from the Himalayan uh, region uh, down to the coast. Um, and uh, many a time, I think uh, uh, initial questions, like I began to more consciously spend time in the field only about seven or eight years ago. Um, prior to that, my experience was limited and my understanding uh, and knowledge uh, about conservation was very, very limited. It, it was a conscious decision to move into the space in 2012-13. Um, and uh, this whole thing, do we need to be in a real landscape to experience these moments of porosity or can it happen uh, even through screen? Uh, and I think... Um, while yes, there is a substantial difference and an extraordinary uh, kind of um, uh, physicality and viscerality when you are in the landscape. Uh, it is not to say that uh, somebody else's art cannot move you and take you to that space and transport you to that space and experience, um, creating moments of porosity. And uh, some of my most poignant uh, uh, memories of elephants come from uh, his uh, movie, Nagar Hole, Tales of an Indian Jungle. Again, both the Tusker and a relationship between a matriarch and uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, a mother and um, calf. Uh, I think those two uh, sort of remain very vividly in my memory of their walk, their gait, their suffering, their walking through drought, uh, the grief that they experienced. And uh, these, I think, are very uh, sort of um, uh, ways in which we can look at other people's art and uh, draw from that. So this is the close-up of the Tusker from this painting. And again, this has, I don't remember, about 60 or 70 different species in varied landscapes um, that were drawn together. Um, and a last set of paintings, I think I'm running out of time, but um, very quickly to um, sort of wind up. Uh, would you meet me pretty please? Um, I have nieces who are six and 11 and uh, they are at that stage where they are uh, sort of enticing us with pretty please. Can I get this pretty please? Can I have a pet? And uh, so I wanted to sort of bring in that uh, very playful way of um, connecting uh, in relationship with elephants. So um, this is, uh, again, a set of questions drawing from that playfulness of spirit. Uh, elephant mystery, elephant play, elephant adventure, elephant wonder, elephant mischief, elephant friendship, elephant love, elephant dance, elephant embrace, elephant glee, elephant madness, elephant rage. Elephant gentle, elephant guide. Would you meet me, elephant spirits, pretty please, in that secret place in my heart? Um, so just a couple more of paintings. So this is again a recent work that I did. Um, it just was a momentary vision uh, when I was thinking, what do I want to draw of elephants? And somehow I suddenly just spent elephants were very light, they were light as feather. 
and it doesn't make sense, but it also makes sense because somehow they can be so still and so silent. Um, and, and of course, the, the other side of it is the human animal conflict because they can be that silent. But uh, I just find it remarkable that this, uh, this you know, huge uh, creature uh, can somehow be so still, so silent, then it almost makes me feel that they're as light as feather. Uh, so this is just, um, you know, you can interpret it however you want, but it's gathering elephant dream. Are elephants as light as feather? Are they so still that they can be silent? Are elephants playing? Are they dreaming? Can I gather elephant dream in reeds and water, cloud and forest? Is it elephant dreams, elephant heart, elephant soul, elephant spirit, elephant time or elephant wonder? What gathers and wanders through my being in precious fleeting touch and embrace? Uh, this is an older work from 2007, I think. Um, I have trained as a Bharatanatyam dancer for about 15 years and I find uh, using dance gives me a way to physically connect with uh, another uh, species. So very often, even when I'm not necessarily gesture, gesturing or moving, uh, uh, Bharatanatyam training teaches you to bring in the gesture of another being into yourself. So uh, just the elephant, uh, where if you say, I'm going to have the trunk, I'm going to have the ear, how will you uh, sort of embrace the body in order to become elephant? Because at that point, you, the dancer, have become an elephant. You are no more uh, human. And you have to embody that species. And it, it takes time, uh, not only to practice the gesture, but it comes from observation of real elephant walking. It is not simply saying that, oh, this is the gesture and dance and let me do it. You have to think, what is that weight of the year that moves? What is that sort of, you know, a trunk that somehow can be so gentle and at the same time move in so many different directions? And how do you bring that flexibility to your arm, which perhaps is not as flexible as an elephant trunk? And you become the body of the elephant. So uh, this is from um, a series that I'd illustrated uh, called Kotrave and the Blue Stone, which looks at Shiva and uh, Parvati. And Shiva comes in many different uh, guises. So he's elephants in this and uh, Parvati dances over the elephants. So I just wanted to bring it in for the sense of dance and play. Um, and with this, I'll end my talk again with another poem by uh, Reina Maria Rilke. Uh, it, it is this question of, have we created these unnatural boundaries? and made it into fact. Uh, have we made, devised reality by saying it cannot be um, any, other, any other way? So um, again, a poem to sort of put us in that framework of thinking. Um, ah, not to be cut off, not through the slightest partition, shut out from the law of the stars. The inner, what is it if not the intensified sky? hurled through with birds and deep with the winds of homecoming. Thank you. Stop. Screen share. Give me a minute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think all of us had traveled to a different world altogether and a uh, lot of food for thought of how we can connect um, you know, through to wildlife, and conservation, through so many different forms. And it need not necessarily only be through uh, academics, uh, right. something to ponder over. Um, thank you so much. We shall now uh, move on to the next part of our uh, <clears throat> uh, event, which is uh, conservation again um, with Ms. Bindu Malini and Ramna Chandra Shekhar. Can art help us to kindle the ways of connecting and finding ourselves in relationship with the elephant? Before um, we move on, I would like to introduce the two guests. Please give me a moment. Right. I would like to introduce um, 
the next two guests uh, ms bindu malini bindu malini narayan swami is an indian singer composer graphic designer bindu has trained in both carnatic and hindustani classical forms so no bhai is her first music album created in collaboration with vedant paradwaj she has directed music for feature and documentary films such as harikatha prasanga nati charami setuman brahmi uh, conversations at the kum sare number 0 i think that's a mistake sorry and choral woman she and vedant have co-directed um, music for aruvi a tamil film bindu malini is part of collaborations like the threshold khusrao ke rang akat kahani and saath saath she has won the 66th national award and film fair awards as best singer for the songs she created and sang in the film nati charami i would also like to introduce our next guest mr ramnath chandrashekar ramnath chandrashekar is a conservation educator filmmaker and photographer he has traveled across india to capture inspirational stories that facilitate people's understanding of india's rich natural and cultural heritage he has also led nature and conservation outreach programs to reach out to thousands of students through youth for conservation a non-profit initiative founded by mr shekhar tatatri an internationally acclaimed wildlife and conservation filmmaker he works in a space where visual storytelling education and um, leadership converge he is an ambassador for nature and environment and conducts storytelling workshops through book making photo storytelling and film making with his partner rachita sinha and has co-founded youth conservation action network you can you can of course check out the website that's mentioned on the slide over to um, our guests i would request um shrivi kalyan ma'am yeah to engage with the conversation okay um okay first uh, uh, sort of um, welcome to both ramnath and bindu uh, bindu is a little unwell today so she may uh, not be able to fully participate and i'm hoping that she can give some of her time in the next uh, half an hour um and i have known bindu uh, for the last almost 15 years uh, she was my junior in college and then we eventually worked together and collaborated uh, with music and visual art um at different points of time again with uh, ramnath i've known him for the last eight to nine years um, and we worked on uh, some conservation education projects together and uh, uh, it it's a very interesting space for me to be in conversation with both of them and that's sort of the context uh, to uh, set the uh, tone for the three of us talking it i guess it's more uh, coming from a space of friendship rather than um, a very formal conversation um, so couple of things that we wanted to sort of initiate and have conversation and uh, if i'm uh, if i can frame it one was to say what is the space of art and nature today uh, in india particularly and how are we thinking about it in terms of both uh, educating artists uh, training artists where does india stand and we start with a bit of that conversation then we delve into uh, our own personal experiences with the elephant um the question of education at large uh, conservation education at large and uh, and since each of us bring different media uh, to the table ram brings uh, photography and film i bring painting illustration and poetry and uh, bindu brings music uh, we wanted to uh, sort of veer the conversation towards how others can connect uh, using some of these tools uh, so that's largely the space from where uh, we hope this conversation will happen Uh, Bindu, do you want? Are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you start off with what you had uh, initially uh, stated about the issue of where art yes. and nature is today? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, uh, thank you uh, for uh, really initiating a, a dialogue like this. First of all, and uh, thank you, Shrivi, for thinking of me. because when shivi called me honestly i was like shivi why me and uh, then she said 
that's because I know where she comes from that I would be able to hold a conversation with her. And Srivi, I do have something to ask you after I kind of have my sharing here. So when we started talking about the Srivi, me and uh, Ram, what was extremely amplified for me was the fact that um, the elephants um, are not really so much part of the music that I practice or the music that's largely practiced. So it's not part of the collective consciousness or the collective um, music that's explored and expressed. Of course, I'm sure um, people who are involved with music and conservation are doing it very uh, in a very focused manner, but uh, at large, it's very anthropocentric. And uh, the fact that our mind space doesn't include and embrace all these beings was really like a slap on my face and that's that's what i told shrivi saying shrivi i should talk about the fact that i didn't have not engaged with this all this while and i think we it's it could be a starting point for many of us and having journeyed with music in a professional manner for the last eight years now i guess i'm feeling quite ready to expand myself now and uh, in the way that Srivi spoke of porosity in that expansion there is value and through this art and that expansion I feel there is a way to kind of bring back or or re or evoke or make it common to have all the species um, embody us or we embody them or we live together and uh, just like how there's a loss of habitat and then there's a loss and the, the, the kind of distancing that's happening and we take it for granted. Maybe there has to be a call coming back from us. And this was a beautiful reminder for me to bring that into, first of all, my consciousness and then probably start my walk from there. Um, my hope is that someday I get to walk with elephants. I don't think anybody can not be in awe uh, or in love with a, a beautiful being like an elephant. And um, the only closest thing that I did was that recently I have been following a singer from uh, who's moved to Kerala back to her home. And there is a, an elephant in her home. And uh, it's been there for 10 years and she keeps posting her musical interactions with that elephant. Uh, so that's been absolutely moving for me. And I got to speak to her and she said how he's not very fond of percussions, but he really uh, sways to her guitar uh, and singing. And when she plays the flute and if she plays sustained notes, he's so still there. And his listening changes her music. And I think that's one kind of a porosity that uh, Shivi is talking about here. And also that she also said how in her, in when she's in the presence of different people, different beings, her being changes. And what she noticed was that when she's in the presence of this elephant, her ability to empathize really changes and she can feel it. So, um, I, I was very happy to get in touch with somebody who has a... And she says how the presence of the elephant changes everything about the energy in the house. And um, I now I, she's invited me to meet him. <laughs> so that's a great starting point. And we just had a conversation that uh, we will probably work with music and about elephants in a more conscious way. Um, so that's what i wanted to bring in apart from that what i wanted to ask shrivi is that while we were talking about this she did mention about um how she processed grief and that's where her journey began with education and conservation and art and it so it was a common point of exchange between the two of us almost 10 years ago she reminded me of this grief and uh, even now, I feel that grief uh, after this, the way she has reminded me 
of how I have probably cut certain consciousness out of me, what would the grief I would feel, uh, what would be the grief that I would feel if um, I don't even acknowledge the vacuum or the void that I may already have inside me in the absence of a species disappear. So I would like to know how Shri, we turn this grief into this this body of work and this this inquiry. Thank you, Dindu. I'm also going to ask Ram to sort of share a bit and then the three of us can be in conversation. So Ram, any of the tracks that uh, we have started off with. Uh, and again, uh, one moment, the the, um, the Sittanavasal painting that I had done, um, Ram and I had visited it together and uh, he introduced that landscape of Pudukote to me and we were just sitting there by the caves and he said, he was on his own journey, I was on my own journey and I was sketching and quite unexpectedly I was searching for uh, my current sketchbook which I couldn't find so I picked up an old sketchbook and I found sketches from the cave and uh, it again brings back the memory of many early conversations that we had where I had not yet entered conservation uh, and conservation education and he had been already as a very young person um, you know from a very young age he has been looking into this world uh, so it, it was an exceedingly beautiful uh, set of conversations that opened my experience of landscape and world. Uh, and the fact that both of us enjoyed poetry, we enjoyed uh, talking about how culture could bring in um, the way we experience nature in a whole different paradigm. And what is it that we have forgotten about traditional ways of knowing and experiencing nature? Um, so uh, over to you, Ram, to sort of bring in the conversation and then I'll tie it together again. Sure. Thank you, Shivi. Thank you, Bindu, for sharing this. And thank you, everybody, part of the Friends of Elephants for uh, organizing this really interesting and uh, insightful talk discussion. Uh, well, I think the traditional ways of uh, knowing, uh, that is one of the aspects that really got me connected with elephants and that is one of the reasons why I okay, I will be part of uh, this conversation uh, like you know when when I was in sixth or seventh standard uh, you know we were reading a lot of books about elephants and you know elephants in the story of signs and you know the her matriarchal herd the elephant as a herd and the matriarch all of that so earlier you know when I was exploring uh, photography as a medium uh, you know, I, I didn't get the opportunity to travel to a place like Sitanavasil to look at the cultural dimension of elephant when I was uh, young. You know, so the immediate thing was, you know, going to safaris and, uh, you know, kind of disconnected with the land and having this uh, visual image of the things that we read in uh, books, you know, common uh, larger narratives. And that's something that reflected in the way I captured pictures, you know, like majestic elephants. Okay, while we wait for Ram, let me respond to what Bindu brought in. Sorry, uh, am, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible now. Thank you. Sorry about that. The internet got disconnected here. A uh, couple of years later, I think I was probably my eighth grade or ninth grade. I had this opportunity to uh, walk in the forests of Piriya Tiger Reserve. It was a game road with uh, dirt tracks and it was an inclined uh, uh, space. You know, there was an incline on one side it's going up the hill and there was an incline on the uh, other side, which is going down. And I was walking with the uh, Mannan uh, forest dwellers and uh, Mr. Kannan. And Kannan actually found an elephant in the bush, you know, in the undergrowth, about 30 to 40 feet from where we were walking. We were just the two of us. And uh, the moment, you know, the, the moment I saw the elephant through that undergrowth, just that uh, you know, animals standing 
30 to 40 feet in front, I sensed this great deal of nervousness and anxiety and, uh, you know, such emotions going through it. And that was the time I realized that there is also a similar sense of fear that the elephant is going through when it sees a, a species that's not, uh, you know, they're walking in its ecosystem, you know. And uh, this happened about 10 years before I met uh, Shrivi and before I started to know about uh, uh, porosity as a principle and as connecting with the being. And the moment I started to connect with elephants like this, uh, the way in which uh, I started to capture stories with the uh, camera changed. And that's something that we know when Bindu and Srivi were, uh, and I were discussing this uh, for the call, uh, we had this question, you know, does, does bias impact the story that we want to tell? You know, and that's a very pertinent question that, uh, I'm, I'm always thinking when I'm, uh, you know, visualizing and stories to capture. And that's, that's something, uh, you know, and I feel that that portion of it is missing very much in the school system, you know, how might we uh, enable children to connect with nature as a being, you know, and how do you bring that traditional form of talking, like when Srivi mentioned, I think uh, the way in which you are walking in a land, you know, feeling that land and being connected with the land. How do we create more of such opportunities for the younger generation? And that's the area from which most of the work that my life's partner and I do currently. You know, and that's that's a question that's uh, been in my mind. Uh, you know, whenever we think about, you know, how do you connect and build relationship with elephants and with the diversity, and how can art be a medium? And by art, you know the the anything you know as diverse as it can and i would love to hear about that question from Srini too you know how might we bring in the movement of connecting uh, with the land and with the being there that's yeah um so sort of to tie in tight uh, both conversations together um i think i'm going to start with the grief question and then move into uh, the education question uh, like Bindu said, it, I think way back in 2009 or 10, both of us had a conversation. I'd just been uh, on a trip to um, Dehradun and uh, you know, spent time in Tanolti, Masuri and Rishikesh. Um, and um, I came back with extraordinary grief for the way the landscape was being uh, blasted, mined, uh, you know, and several kinds of buildings uh, uh, rising there for tourism purposes. Um, and some, I mean, like, and through the night, you're hearing this blasting happening. And part of it also, because Dehradun is a, um, a army area, you're also constantly hearing sounds that seem uh, completely out of context of the natural uh, stillness and natural silence that you can feel. And, um, and likewise, uh, Bindu's experience in a different landscape, and both of us talked about this intense kind of grief. And we were just, I mean, you don't know why you have moved so much. You don't know why you have gone into this depression and crying. And, um, and, and to be frank, there is no more control of your own emotion because you are grieving for something that so far you have not, I mean, you have loved, but you have never thought about the gravity of what's happening to it. Um, and we are talking about the late 20s, early 30s, when we sort of are, um, until then there is, a, we had a certain love. I mean, we knew that we always loved nature. We enjoyed being in nature. All my art before and after has been about having natural elements in it. But somehow this grief was overwhelming grief for the landscape, uh, overwhelming, overwhelming grief for the species. And like Bindu very beautifully said, what is the vacuum that gets created in us when uh, another species dies out? Do we ever think about that? And um, um, and and to me, that sort of a space um, is, and for many of us, it's it, it's a moment of paralysis. You have incredible grief, and then uh, a sense of hopelessness. Then there's a sense of paralysis and just inability to move forward, um, and not knowing how to move forward. And then comes this problem of uh, education and. Uh, the fact that you have no tools, you want to do something and then you have no tools, you have no access. Uh, and you realize that like in my case, I was in the field of art and um, 
directly I did not have connection with artists who were doing wildlife art or conservation work kind of thing. And um, my own training in the arts, much like what Bindu said, does not have environmental consciousness in it at all. You're not trained. You may draw landscape painting and that's about it. Uh, you're not thinking environmental consciousness. You're not thinking environmental art. And you realize that the people who are going into the landscape or doing conservation work have specialization in ecology or conservation and a whole different set of field, which somehow um, there is a disconnect between who, what our training is and where we want to go. Um, and uh, I was lucky to meet uh, several people at the time when these transitions were happening for me and uh, uh, people who said, okay, here's a way that you could do it. And I mean, nobody had one way to do it and nobody had a resolution. But then it, it has become a period of research of finding artists to finding environmentalists who want to work with artists, which is another very interesting space uh, where you find that there are many who don't want to work with artists. There is a very clear divide between how they see the world and how we see the world. There is, you know, there's sort of an us in them divide. And there are others who actually do want to bring these spaces together uh, and uh, dissolve these unnatural separations between art and science. Uh, so it's been a very interesting journey. I don't want to go too, too much into it uh, because we are short of time. Uh, but this is, and this uh, sort of is a frame in, with which I entered uh, Srishti in 2014. And again, uh, uh, very lucky that uh, our director uh, sort of invited me to create programs in earth education and communication, uh, to run projects that would be led in environmental art, environmental consciousness, uh, and 2015, I started my PhD and focused on ecological consciousness and aesthetics and art practice. Um, so it, it gave me a chance to work through my grief um, by finding active ways of engaging through uh, both environmental education and conservation education and the practice of art itself. Uh, and to uh, move um, uh, 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 what we were just discussing yesterday between the three of us, uh, a lot of times we create art saying, let me create an elephant motif or put it on a t-shirt or create elephant earrings and somehow it can, uh, you know, matter to art. And not to say that maybe one can use it for fundraising, one can use it in different ways to um, create uh, people who may get more and more interested in the species, but uh, not necessarily does such a practice engage in um, connection. You, you could create art like that and, and stay disconnected from the natural world. Uh, so how does one move beyond that to a deeper and more uh, conscious way of engaging through the arts? That became a very uh, pertinent inquiry for me. Um, and from there, I developed several uh, learning programs um, and both my practice and my practice as, uh, as an artist and my practice as an educator evolved. Um, but it is not to say that moments of grief are done with and over with and you have action plan in place. I feel that it's a philosophical inquiry uh, that moves you uh, and, it, and it's a constant journey throughout. Uh, grief does not end, grief morphs, grief transforms, grief becomes other things, but there is still um, uh, grief. And the fact that as long as we are human, uh, however we minimize our lifestyles, there is a certain pressure that we are putting by virtue of the current um, sort of contemporary space we have created as a world. So what does it all mean in so many ways um, for us to think about? I think that's really where um, I would probably sort of tie together um, the conversation. And coming back to the question of what would it mean to transform the art education space for environment? I think that's, that's a very important question to ask um, because one of the things I remember discussing with many of my uh, good friends here um, was like, if, if, we don't, if we don't know how to enter through sciences, if we don't know how to enter through biology and ecology and other things, and we only have, I mean, but we want to still work in the arts. There are many students who don't have access uh, because they don't have a direct, uh, way of entering or a direct relationship. Um, and then how do you turn it around for them? And how do you use the arts to turn it around for them? So um, 
like now we do a lot of nature journaling and artistic work through nature journaling, a uh, lot of storytelling based work. Um, again, poetry I find as a very evocative way to introduce uh, music also as a very beautiful and powerful medium. Um, many a time, um, some of my students are here present today and what we have done is we have just played nature music. Uh, and we have worked in response to the music to open the heart. Uh, and um, so I think there are innumerable and multiple ways that we as a collective need to design because there's no one way to it. And um, it cannot happen without visceral and embodied engagement with landscape. Um, and it's not about saying, I like elephant, I like tiger, I don't like mosquito, I don't like something else. Um, I don't think it's about that. It's really about being in relationship. Um, and in relationship, you, you can't deny one part of a person, one part of a emotion. You have to gather all of it. And likewise, if one were to think of nature as another being that you're in relationship with, then how do you experience uh, and how do you connect the dots? I think that's where I would stop and ask the other two to step in. Um, I think we have shared a lot. Ram, I don't know what you feel. Uh, Ankun, if, uh, if there's anything that you want to ask. Hi, hello. hello. Yes, so yeah, we have some questions coming in uh, as well. So would you want to continue with the questionnaire session or would you want to have a conversation before we could jump into the question. Question. Shimi, you're on mute. So, uh, would either of you like to add and have another round of conversation, or would, should we move into the questions? I think question questions are good. Bindu, what about you? Yeah, I think uh, I kind of stated what I wanted to and uh, Srivi really extended that conversation forward. So, um, I mean, there are many things, many more things that we can always talk about. Uh, but I guess it's good to get into uh, okay. responding to some questions and then maybe we can come back to a conversation if something, uh, if there's any burning sharing. All right. Okay. So there's this question from Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay wants to know uh, from uh, uh, Sanjay's question is to Srivi. Uh, he wants to know how design as a concept as a role to play in conservation. Um, so there are multiple ways in which you can use design. It, it, uh, I mean, one is that design as a field itself is large. There is the meta idea of design that, you know, you could design uh, a uh, how do I put it? Um, at a meta level, when you say design, anything that we do is design. So if you're even designing a, a conservation program, then you're designing something. Um, it could go into say designing an interpretation center, uh, designing an interpretation center for a zoo, for a school, for any sort of a community. Uh, if you go specifically into product design or um, if you're looking at graphic design, then the way you would work with design would be very different. Um, and again, um, in what context are we going to design? That becomes very critical. And how are we going to interpret this context? I think much of the challenge is that, um, like for instance, you have sustainability as a framework today, you have um, multiple frameworks available. And many a time uh, people design without having experienced landscape. They come in as designers, uh, you're having preliminary conversations or uh, fewer conversations with people and you jump into design. Um, and then it leaves one with a very superficial sense of design, but there are you know, extraordinary designers who have spent years um, working with the landscape, working with ecologists, working with conservationists on the field and understanding the issues and from there designing uh, and creating material. And additionally, for activism, I think there's a lot of work it, that design can offer um, both in terms of uh, work towards activism, work towards creating educational toolkits um, and uh, work towards awareness building. So I feel like it depends on where we want to ground ourselves as designers and which one of these we may want to engage with. 
Uh, today, there's a lot of collaborative work happening between conservationists and designers as well uh, in working with community. So um, a, a, a lot of the conservation concepts which look at how do we engage closely with community in order to um, shift their engagement with the uh, space they are in. Uh, and this sort of uh, collaborative design sensibility is also um, quite, uh, I mean, a lot of beautiful projects have emerged in that space. So I think there are many, many different ways from which we can enter the space of design. Right, right. So uh, Bindu Malini and Ramnath, you know, uh, you guys also come from uh, different different side of design, you know, uh, graphic design and then Ramnath from photography perspective. So you want to add something to this or have a different thought? Um, okay, so for me, I don't know. I, um, yeah, I think to to talk about it, to express is a very uh, important starting point. And uh, to take it from there and to be conscious of every decision we take. And um, how is that impacting? What is the impact of every little thought and action of us? I mean, it's a very... What I'm saying is somewhere a little spiritual, but that's exactly what it is. And uh, in that is where we connect with, we we need to know that we are connected and we are interconnected and um, make sure each and every thought, action has its own repercussions and that we need to know that this is what's happening and be in that awareness um, and to somewhere stand by that even in terms of design choices or life choices as much as possible like she rightly mentioned just the contemporary uh, lifestyle. landscape or lifestyle that we have has already kind of shrunk the way we live or the amount of impact we already have um one big reason i left design actually was um in fact, my first big hoarding was for a wildlife film festival. <laughs> so <laughs> I was so happy to see my design blown up to that proportion. I stood there and in exactly two minutes, it just like, uh, I just went away because the realization just dawned on me. I'm like, what did I just, it's just this big uh, printed canvas that's going to just go waste. <laughs> you know and uh, after that it was like so disappointing <laughs> so um somewhere i kind of started moving away from design because of the application of design um that at least i was doing so be it print or everything that was happening in terms of quantity um i said i guess music is a better choice it's a uh, in terms of conservation it's it's the amount of energy used is way less so yeah i don't know if i really added to what she was saying but i kind of <laughs> took off <laughs> right uh, Ram. yes i think design uh, from a storytelling perspective from a visual storytelling perspective is something that i've been exploring uh, quite often especially in, in the recent times when you know, whenever we approach a story today, you you have uh, numerous gadgets with which you can film and photograph uh, animals and diversity, right? And like every time when uh, you know nowadays when I watch a film, it opens with a aerial shot of a drone, and you know, and uh, when I look at uh, design of many of this. I'm often uh, asking one question: uh, Is the medium that we are using to capture stories is it dominating the story you know is it you know that's that's something that you know, what what is the story that you would like to say is, is the medium dominating the message or the area that is there you know I, in fact uh, like for example uh, uh, i remember this experience uh, about 10 years ago in bandipur uh, with the elephants and uh, in fact i'd like to show that picture if that's uh, uh, possible uh, you know, like uh, this is uh, uh, 
you know this i i just wanted to show that trajectory of how uh, a visual uh, process evolves in capturing things you know like this is a picture that i took before i had the sensibility of being connected with the place and uh, where to pausing to observe what's happening there you know and these are normal pictures that you can see of uh, elephants anywhere you know and uh, about 4 or 5 years later i was in fact uh, trying to visualize uh, while being with an elephant herd and you know that's when you start to really pause and slow down and start to look at what's happening and how do you actually connect with the uh, uh, animal as a being and you know so these are some pictures uh, and this is a moment that i really so closely attached you can see the calf that's uh, really inclined and it's uh, lying on the trunk of the uh, elephant that's standing next to it you know and as we start to observe uh, uh elephant you know such sentient beings closely you know how it's uh, kicking the uh, grass and you know all of that you start to when you slow down and when you visualize the story that you want to say i think that's when the uh, uh, emotion comes out and that's when you start to build a relationship with what you want to capture you know that's something as a design that uh, i find lacking in many uh, young people with cameras these days you know you go right. with the camera and with the long lens and you photograph it but are, are we uh, 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 you know pausing enough to see why do we need to use the equipment or what is the story that we want to say you know and i'm recollected of this moment of how we bring in this movement you know ele- elephants they move a lot and you know how what is the story that you want to capture and then use the tool that we have as a medium to say that right. and that's something as a design if we can bring it uh in a sensibility uh you know that's uh, i would love to see that in visual design and that's how i i'm approaching it these days you know whether it's the education uh-huh. or the film making that i work you know that's uh, that's something that I wonderful wonderful yes we we do yeah. see that in your photographs and we do see that in the paintings as well from uh, from uh, shrivi uh, so uh, a follow up question on that you know uh, uh, i also want to club multiple questions here for the same topic uh, to shrivi and you again right so uh, uh, you know i understand that you guys have been taking inspiration from a lot of books and a lot of uh, music and uh, art right and that's what uh, helps you in creating a design that will inspire the uh, inspire people right so first question is how do we inspire larger audience bigger mass of people right uh, than the targeted audience the second question is uh, i know that you are into um, uh, uh, nature education and uh, uh, you know the things so can we also add this to a school curriculum that we we uh, introduce this at a very young age you know i ask this because i know for for a fact that children have been wrongly influenced by uh, by stories and books about wildlife especially hyenas for example right everyone knows that hyena is a bad creature by default right from from very young you have been told that hyena you watch jungle book you see hyena being a bad creature right so that's that's i think that's something that's been uh, that's been uh, infused to the minds of this young people right so can we uh, by by means of art or music or painting uh uh you know uh, create some kind of uh, curriculum or create kind of some kind of element that can reach the mass mass audience right uh so i think one of you can take it first and um, i hope i was clear with my question yeah 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 and and i think we we've, we've been working on uh, <laughs> i mean this uh, ram has perhaps done more of the larger numbers than i have in 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 a certain sense i have worked with smaller groups closer groups uh, and of course collaborated with him on the larger groups in terms of designing the educational material uh, so one i am just going to leave this link on the chat window um, mm-hmm. it's um, um, i worked with kit central which is a school in chennai uh, for a semester on using creative writing and different forms of art uh, with grades 1 to 7 for environmental education uh so a lot of the methods that i use it's about a 40 minute film and i think um, uh whatever methods i have used uh in terms of the kind of books that i read out to them the kind of material and the way they can take up an issue and turn it into um artwork is been captured there so um, again in in the interest of time for those who are interested you can uh, view that and 
um, Bindu's uh, voice is the music for the film. So there is that old interlink that we had for this particular film. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, I'm looking at two of the questions that you're asking. One is how do we design uh, for education and what do we design when we say we are going to put it into the curriculum? Um, I think there are several uh, ways to think about it. One is, of course, um, whether it is the urban uh, child that we are looking at or a child who's living close uh, to any of the forest reserves or right. uh, village um, life. Right. What is the backyard wildlife and how do you learn to just observe? How do you learn to capture the stories? And somehow giving them um, a space for more and more time in nature. I feel is anyway the most uh, effective and essential way to engage them. Um, what has worked in some of the sessions that I've conducted is uh, beautiful illustrated children's storybooks. And I work mm -hmm. with uh, diverse audiences, uh, young and old with these children's books, uh, which take you through sensorial experience of nature, emotional experience of nature, um, uh, the life of a species. So I have a collection of uh, nature books that I've you know, uh, collected over a period of time. And each book makes you look at a different aspect of nature. So I think somehow uh, a curriculum needs to unfold the heart, right? Like you, you need to be thinking about it in that manner, both the heart and the mind and the intellect. Uh, and you want children to not just be able to experience, you want them to be able to articulate, to write about it, to speak about it actively. Um, to also know where they come from. And uh, Ram can sort of add on, add into this piece because we, we try to create a series of exercises and games uh, for um, a, a youth program that he ran uh, in which we looked at um, one of the toolkits that we had uh, designed as an exercise or activity kit for that program was uh, children could choose the role they wanted to play. So somebody could be a photographer, you could be a lawyer, you could be, you know, multiple roles. They had cards that they could wear. And then they, they could just uh, go in and say, I want to be a lawyer, but can I do something for the environment being a lawyer? Whereas somebody else says, I want to be an artist. And then we did team exercises. So you put a lawyer and an artist and somebody else from a different sort of, uh, you know, like whatever roles they picked up, then how would they collaboratively use those roles to engage with nature? So uh, there is, yes, there is, and there's a lot of scope. And I have seen my students design some fantastic material and work in mm -hmm. how to interact with uh, nature and uh, students who have brought in uh, tribal ways of knowing and saying that can we bring like Santal experiences of nature or Toda experiences of nature and how they experience the world and bring that actively into education. So the, these are also, I think, very important questions uh, that we need to ask because what is this knowledge of nature or what is this experience of nature we are talking about and how does every culture and every community in India, I mean, like we have innumerable ways of interacting with nature in India. Right. So it's not about one tool, one method. Uh, right. Especially for educators, I think it's very important to open their minds to these multiple ways of the world and also multiple realities because the Santal reality of nature is not the same as my reality of nature. Right. The nature that they experience and the world they, they see is different. And we had gone to Meghalaya and we, uh, you know, looked at the Khasi tribes and others and we interacted with them. And they and their way of experiencing their forest was very different from what we understood of forest as an entity. So uh, I think it's a much larger conversation that needs to be invited. And we probably need a bunch of us sitting together and exploring diverse ways of creating material, creating curriculum, creating educational tools and methods. And sometimes I think uh, like working with somebody who has a completely different set of skills and two educators going into the scenario works beautifully. Like, um, I mean, I, I, I work with um, uh, Anupama Arun, who's I think today uh, there, she's uh, also been in uh, both biology and conservation and uh, Guru Raja, who's a batricologist. Uh, we would, they would also take us into the field. And the way they would open the field to us was very different from how I as an artist would open the field to my students. So then we have found ways to bring two worlds together and open both at simultaneously to a student. 
and that changes perspectives for the student. So I think there are these are possibly uh, some ways that I can share. Uh, Ram, over to you. You have done bigger programs, so you want to share not, that. <laughs> not at all, Shivi. I'm deeply inspired by your work and you know, being very modest by saying that. I think, uh, like, uh, you know, I, I don't have answers. And if there are answers, then, like Shivi had mentioned some time back, I think the world would be a better place. One uh, thought that I had is, uh, uh, you know, having conversations on the place that they are in, the land, I think anchoring programs there, you know, how do we do that? I think that's the question that uh, I ask quite often, you know, because, you know, uh, I've been using films of uh, filmmakers and I've been using my work in photography in various places. But one of the things that, uh, you know, that's grossly lacking is stories of the place that they are coming from. You know, like, for instance, uh, you know, during the lockdown a few days, a few uh, weeks back, I had an Oriole visiting my hometown. You know, 20 years, 25 years back when we were here, I had not seen Orioles. And, you know, even the kind of water systems that are there in a particular town, the cultural connect and providing students multiple lenses to ask questions, you know, than giving the answers, you know, how do we uh, provide multiple dimensions for them to ask questions about the land and how do we do it in an exciting manner? And how do we provide that space for expression? You know, that's where uh, I feel uh, a lot of work can be done. Like, for example, uh, one of the uh, activities that we had designed, uh, that Srivi had designed for our program is called Bridge the Gap. And uh, that's an activity where children are uh, looking at their land across different generations. And they do that by having conversations with uh, elders in their community. You know, how would how was their land when their parents were in school or when their elders were in school, you know, going across generations. And I remember this uh, four uh, different uh, images, uh, illust you know, expressions of a child who's a sixth grader in a place called Rajapalayam and he had drawn this 1970s land with agri you know, it's an agricultural land and he had also drawn the snake and the rat and he had also mentioned the survey number of that land in the side. And over the next 40 years, uh, he had shown the way in which the land has transitioned from that to a coconut field, to a plot, a lot of plot numbers, and then to houses. You know, so that is going 80, 80 years back. And you know, even how do we even create those questions to go back even further? How it was. So creating these kind of questions and you know, in an exciting manner and giving opportunities for children to have those experiences. Locally, I think uh, uh, that's something that I would love to leave as a question, you know, but I don't have answers and I would never have answers. Uh, but I think being with questions is a lot more meaningful and purposeful. So right. uh, that, that's what I would like to share. And to the uh, other point that you made, Uncle, of uh, how do we do this um, in greater numbers and right. can sort of look at a mass um, uh, way of interacting. I mean, I think it, it's something that we have continuously uh, pondered about um, with many, many of the educators that I know. And uh, with Ram, when he was running this program across uh, 30 schools in Tamil Nadu, um, how much do we need uh, personal interaction and how much can it be, um, you know, a movement that sort of builds on itself? Um, I don't have uh, specific answers and maybe Bindu, you can jump in with your experience of Kabir project, which is a completely different uh, um, sort of a frame, but through music, they have been able to create a massive movement. And I don't know if uh, there is something similar that one can think of um, creating for uh, environment. Uh, because uh, in environment, we don't find that sort of uh, a mass movement. We find that there are small groups, intense groups that are at work. Uh, you find a wildlife film festival, you find uh, many small things that are happening in, uh, and excellent things that are happening in smaller frameworks. But how do we look at it, one, as a movement? And then how do we look at it, perhaps, at the policy level uh, shift in curriculum and educational design and um, I think some of my students are here uh, who did this work in looking at environmental education and policy 
in the last 60 years. Uh, and, and they traced uh, environmental policy in India going to pre-colonial times and bringing it all the way to current times and looking at uh, uh, issues or um, availability of policy in the first place. And one of the things, I don't know if any of you are here. Mahesh, are you here? Sneha or Mahesh? Yeah, yeah, ma'am, I'm here. Uh, Mahesh, can you just jump in and uh, share what your uh, sort of insight was, the fact that you guys didn't find enough material? And I think there's a lot of work left to be done in policy. Uh, so Mahesh, if you can just share a bit. Yeah, actually what we did was uh, we looked into the NEP and uh, our main focus was on environmental education. So when we dug uh, deeper into the whole NEP thing, then there was so less about environmental education. There was no systematic um, answer to it. I mean, uh, how they are going to teach environmental education to students and how uh, they are like uh, integrated into the course. So what we found was environmental education is not something not environmental education is itself not very a conventional subject it's not something that we can teach with integrating like with a particular syllabus structure that we have like it's not mathematics it's not uh, it's not some uh, something which is like yeah so uh, so we found uh, we were trying to like uh, uh, yeah, that, this was the, I think the presentation, the whole wireframe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we created a whole wireframe where this way, uh, we created a web page uh, with the homepage and everything. And we divided our topics into like educators, how teachers should be while teaching, what is necessity uh, as a teacher, what values uh, he should have as an educator of an environment, environmental education. And uh, there was another topic which was based on digital versus paper uh, and the, how traditional knowledge system and another topic was on traditional knowledge system. And the final was the attitude towards uh, environmental education. What are the students attitude and how teachers are reacting to the environmental education uh, on this. So, yeah. okay. I mean, so there is a lot of work left to be done, yeah. which is what we figured out by yeah, the Yeah, there is a lot of work left. And there is a lot of research still left to be yeah. done. Because and here, we're struggling. I mean, they, they really looked into an EVS integrated curricula, what's missing, what, what do we need to do? And I feel like it's, a, again, like I said, we need to create a gathering of people. We probably need, uh, uh, you know, more mindset work and more practical ways of taking it forward because Otherwise, it becomes like there is a class that you teach and then it's over. Right. Something left yeah. in the consciousness. And if, if the student chooses to pursue that path, it is there. Otherwise, it's not there. So uh, it, it's a slow seeping. But uh, if we want to make shifts at a larger level, then I think this is the kind of work we need uh, people to be trained in doing and wanting to do. And also understanding that there's a lacune here and that we need to construct work in this area. Right, right. Excellent. Oh, I, I think uh, also a question to uh, Bindu Malini uh, regarding this same topic about educating the mass. All right. Are you, uh, there's a question from one of the uh, participants. Uh, would you like to create a music album for elephants? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what all this has got me thinking is that um, music is a great way. I mean, I'm trying to build this uh, curriculum anyway for children now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, young ones so um, where I was my focus so far has been that we kind of make sure we cover all the different languages states of India in the songs that we teach um, now to add to it if it can definitely um, surely have the flora and fauna represented in those languages and in the in the practice and dialogue with your um, environment. I think that's a great way to start, kickstart the imagination and play for children in their minds and heart with this kind of an imagination of a habitat. Um, so to kind of have it as a recurring motive uh, or to say, let's say, for example, I'm just throwing it out here saying, Okay, the, like how you say elephant is just the starting point for you for the kind of work you do. So if I say elephant and I'll say, I'll, like Sri was saying, I'll cover, I'll take songs, I'll invite 
songs from all parts of the world and our country and make it into a curriculum then the next can be another animal and it can go on and on and on and on and when it's just elephant it doesn't just stop there it, it immediately binds and brings in all the other uh, um, the, the entire ecosystem that an elephant would need to thrive. So it's a great idea and I would definitely do that. And um, uh, like the uh, Srivi spoke about Kabir project. I think what was beautiful and fantastic and successful about the Kabir project is that uh, their documentation and their research was very deep. And finally, how they made it reach uh, the mass is not just the films but the singing and the music and the music was drawing out of the existing folk traditions and giving it back and somehow they are bridging the rural and the urban mindsets and kind of creating a common platform of what every human being was seeking so um, something like that is very possible uh, even with this even with ecology and even with conservation and the fact that it's so sahaj, it's so at ease and that everybody could draw out of the Kabir project and start creating their own community. It was so community based that everybody could join hands and bring in their resources and strength. So um, therefore, like you said, Srivi, Kabir project and the way it took from music and gave it back as music. Uh, although traversing through design, website, research and films, I think um, music really becomes a great entry point uh, and a, a very, 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 very powerful tool of transformation. Right. So could you, could you, would you be also be able to share the uh, link where we can read about the Kabir project maybe? That would also be really, really helpful. Yeah, I can share the link and on YouTube, if you just search for Kabir Project, there are a lot right. of videos that learn much. Perfect. Uh, and also, uh, Shri, I, before I forget, the previous link, yeah. what you were supposed to share, I think uh, is not shared with everyone. I don't oh, see it okay. in the message. I think you'll have to change the uh, audience to everyone before. All right, I will just do that. And uh, right. uh, even um, many of the programs that Ram has run, he has uh, shared, I mean, it's on his website. So I can mm -hmm. paste all our website links here and uh, you're welcome to. That would be really, really. Yeah. yeah. So one, one personal question, I know that's uh, for Ram from my side, but I think I'm, I'm sure a lot of audience would also have the same question for all of you, you know, from, from my side to Ram, because I'm also a wildlife photographer, right? There might be artists, there might be music uh, directors who would want to collaborate with you guys. So how do uh, uh, we to get an opportunity to work with you guys to you know uh, collectively develop something that that uh, drives towards conservation i think everyone can take turns and probably <laughs> take this question you want to go ahead shivi i can no you go ahead first and <laughs> putting all the links together <laughs> okay okay sure because Thanks, you, know, you guys yeah. did mention that uh, you know you guys took some time to connect right to the right yeah, audience yeah. and understand yeah. right so you know, let's let's uh, try to try to let's let's make you know if this forum can be a kickstarter for a lot of people, a lot of us you know would be really really great helpful sure uh, i mean like i think uh, one of the programs that uh, my life's partner and i convene is a program for young environmental educators and uh, we are uh, doing that as a fellowship program for a year where we uh, support young nature enthusiasts to create eco clubs in schools and in that mm -hmm. process enable children to connect with nature and uh, conservation and that's an area where uh, i uh, believe that we can collaborate that's something that we are, what we do is we, we look at the space and the land that they are coming from and then through conversations we help them create a program and, uh, you know, it's a one year long process and uh, we are currently uh, running that program in eight uh, states across India. And that's a program where uh, we find people from different backgrounds coming together to enable that program, photographers, educators and uh, politicians, you know, and that's something that 
uh, definitely uh, and uncool being a photographer i'm sure a uh, lot of uh, work can be done through photography and uh, uh, conservation photography especially so that's definitely uh, welcome it's a program called earth ambassadors and okay. uh, you can find more about the program in the website you can dot in okay and uh, mm-hmm. apart from that it's mainly uh, uh, this is uh, while we do this as an organization and i think it's just having conversations you know like right initially like this one conversation like this one and uh, you know like uh, connecting uh, interested people to you know uh, have that opportunity and that's an area that we informally uh, support and you know uh, i mean not individually but as a community and as a collective like she mentioned and that's definitely welcome any time yeah and i mean uh, same uh, in in my case happy to collaborate with anybody uh, it's, it's always just a question of time and how do we find time to do actual projects is one one different uh, question but leaving that aside i think uh, the starting point of having conversations and uh, and i'm open to having conversations with anybody who's interested um and um, in any way if they find that my art can be uh, become a part of their work or if they want um, working with educational design for specific programs um, that's one of the things and um, the last um, six seven years in srishti we've de- developed programs that are specific to environmental education through art and design so if there are people here who are interested in um, either bachelor's or masters where they're looking to or even uh, at the doctoral level where you're looking to uh, engage through art and design then perhaps um, like earth education and communication is one of the programs that i lead but there are several other programs as well and uh, what you earlier saw was a work that was a cross between information arts and information design and earth education and communication so um, we are also open uh, to doing projects with our students so that's another way in which uh, if uh, you have an interesting conservation project that you want students to work on uh, then there are different ways in which um, srishti collaborates and creates spaces so that's the other way perhaps that we can look at taking things forward right uh bindu you would like to add as well um yeah i don't have a website or anything but like <laughs> she we said <laughs> i'm i'm happy to have a conversation and uh, then see whether you know i'm able to resonate with it or even add to it with some value so i can be reached through my facebook or my instagram account and uh, i can take up conversations from there perfect thank you thank you all of you uh, so the one more question one more very interesting question i think for uh, shrivi uh, i think we spoke about uh, bindu spoke about uh, uh, you know uh, giving up digital uh, media because of uh, her reasons of using uh, canvas huge canvases right, right? but uh, we all know that we use mongoose hair for the art brushes uh, yes. so yes. <laughs> so th- is there an alternative i mean now there is a lot of alternative in terms of the industry and and um, i mean i yes i have brushes which are 20 years old which are mongoose hair brushes but um, most of the newer brushes are uh, synthetic mm-hmm. um yes there is a difference but i think finer and finer brushes are coming in uh and for me also i stopped working with acrylic as a medium even though i did share a couple of paintings that are uh, in uh, done with acrylic i moved completely to watercolor as a medium uh, in the last couple of years and i decided very consciously um, to think about what material i was using right uh, so there are those kinds of uh, shifts that and it, it is always a question how do you um, like where do we draw the line i believe where do we draw the line and if okay okay let's say i'm doing all this but i'm going to exhibit the work then am i going to frame it with acrylic correct right. correct past we can you know yes. what does, what is that form going to take right, right. Uh, so that this dilemma sort of constantly exists and what is the um, uh, i mean i i think it's a space of dilemma still right. like i don't have a resolution for it uh, right. for me again uh, like bindu said her choice of music mine was to uh, move from a 100% career in uh, being a designer uh, illustrator to uh, being in education 
for almost 50 or 60 percent of my time right or maybe even more sometimes uh, because I felt that I wanted to be uh, in the space of training in mice and uh, more in the area of service rather than in product development or creation or much like Bindu said, you go into the world of design and you're doing flex marketing. Right. And you don't want to work with the material anymore. Um, but you also want to be looking at innovative packaging options and things like that. So there was this constant dilemma to say, which way do I want to go? And I feel like at least the last um, about almost 10 years I've spent, I've actively been an educator for the last 20 years, but for the last 10 years, I felt very strongly that I wanted to create another generation of young people who take forward uh, work in education and look at environmental education, conservation education and understand uh, in a more deeper way and not in a uh, you know superficial way, uh, manner saying say no to plastics and right, right. Uh, things like that like you go deeper than that in terms of your messaging Good. find your own relationship with nature before creating material uh, and don't parrot what everybody else has been saying for the last right. right so somewhere uh, for me that became uh, very critical to say what is a new articulation that needs to be created what is contextual articulation for India that we want to create? And what is landscape-based um, um, material that needs to be developed? Like, I mean, I, I mean, it, uh, at some point, it almost feels foolish uh, for me to remember, but there was a point in 2014 or the 13 or 14 when I'm like walking through a forest and it is only at that point of time I'm realizing, oh, this is a dry deciduous forest, which is what I read in fourth grade about. And something else is a rainforest. You know, and that there is no, there has not been that sort of an intellectual connection made between what you read in the books about all right. kinds of landscapes and actually walking through the landscape and realizing I mean, one has gone to Uti and Kodekanal hundreds of times, but never made it, you know, never registered that here's your rainforest. Right. Um, so for me, I realized that that's how big a gap it is. And every time I ask my students, what do you think is nature? They'll say, when we go outside the city and the conversation starts like that, right? So you forget that the creeper in your house could also be nature okay. and that you have, that nature has become a backdrop. You walk and many a times students have asked me, why should we be interested in environmental education? And I'd say, I mean, you wouldn't survive without the planet. So perhaps that's the reason why you have to, you know, be interested in environmental education. It's not a choice. It's not one of the streams that you can pick up. So for me, those were, I think, um, uh, key mm -hmm. things that have changed as an artist. Um, and I remember, um, which I did share with Bindu and uh, Ram yesterday, um, Vivek uh, Menon's, uh, sorry, am I getting the name right? I'm not <laughs> um, so basically he had talked about uh, his work with um, undercover study, I mean, uh, undercover work in looking at elephant poaching. And one of the biggest places where the tusk is traded is for the piano. Right. And, uh, and for me, that was, I think that was a moment of revelation to say, here's this music of an instrument that I love. Mm -hmm. And it comes from, you know, a terrible um, thing that we do to another species. Mm -hmm. Much like the... Um, Bindu, your you need to mute. Um, and this whole question of what do we mean when we are using material uh, right. to create art which is coming at the cost of another species. Right. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's very ins insightful. You know, it's not only with art, like you said, it's with every everything that we choose, right? Mm -hmm. uh, music, be it photography also. Uh, one way or the other, you are... Uh, invading in in someone someone else's life or someone else's uh, you know uh, ecology so i think being sensitive uh, understanding understanding is most important and then uh, drawing a line is something we all uh, should be doing when right. we uh, you know do anything i think i think on the interest of time uh, i would take the last question and again i will club two questions here Mm -hmm. So one question says, uh, uh, during lockdown, because of lockdown last year, all the challenging situation, how do you uh, still take inspiration, you know, without being able to go out, sitting at home, how do you take inspiration to create an art, right? Mm -hmm. That's one question. Mm -hmm. uh, Follow-up questions in general, how do you, what do you take inspiration as for, the, for your work, for your uh, thing, what you're doing in general? Okay. Um, 
I mean, I, I, again, it's, it's very hard uh, to live in this connected world that we are living in. So I don't think there is any uh, easy answer, but uh, again, maybe a very specific sort of uh, example that I can give is, um, uh, and I have spent a lot of time on screens in the last one and a half years. <laughs> so I, I uh, but one thing that we did try doing as a collective with uh, my current second year master's student, um, we all took, I mean, I largely was going through the space after I'd finished submitting my PhD and creating a series of artworks uh, that came in a post PhD phase. And I was just remembering all my memories and recollections of time in nature, which had sort of, uh, you know, uh, been in a time of very tight writing and uh, college work and administrative work. One just doesn't have this relaxed time in which you can remember what you have seen. So part of it was just saying, okay, here's an experience I remember. And one of it was um, watching a kukul just cross by a waterfall in uh, Kurg. And it was just, a, you know, an instance, by the time I could figure out that it was a kukul, it had passed by. Um, but there was this moment that just came back to me and I had also seen a dancing frog uh, um, on that site. So it was the waterfall, the kukul and the dancing frog. And uh, what I did was um, I unraveled the entire memory, the experience, and I started painting. And for 10, I mean, about six days where I continuously painted, I would just send this as messages uh, on WhatsApp to my students. And uh, we would then have interactive conversations to say uh, their own experience sometimes in nature or uh, a painting that they have done and uh, or questions that they had for me about what, how do I create form or how do I think, how do I imagine? So we ended up using screen in a very creative manner, both um, uh, you know, using WhatsApp as a screen. And then we were also on multiple other things like we were using MS Teams and other things. So um, this of course, in the context of an educator, it was an interesting experience to uh, use screen in multiple ways to engage in nature conversation. Uh, but going back to my, uh, uh, you know, work, just watching documentaries, uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that could be an interesting exercise is not to just watch the documentary, but to uh, do keyframe drawings as you're watching the documentary uh, and just do hundreds of sketches. It doesn't have to be great sketches, right? It can be like stick figure drawing. It doesn't matter. Nice. But you create a sort of an engaged uh, experience where you're beginning to see more closely frame by frame of whatever you're watching. And, uh, and then to start maybe doing sensorial mapping connections uh, where you make this screen a live presence for yourself. Uh, and sometimes some moments stand out, right? Like whenever we are watching a documentary or uh, anything that we watch. Um, and even now I remember um, just watching film, films, uh, general films and right. uh, older Tamil films that I used to be watching. And suddenly I'll see this uh, sort of... Uh, um, shrub jungle sort of landscape, uh, Karasakade and other things. And you just suddenly sit, watch that landscape on TV and your heart is moved. And you don't know why, but you know that somewhere on a train journey or somewhere you really passed see. by that moment. And uh, literally in that moment, the scent of the earth comes back to you. So I feel like just working on your own memories, writing these short notes of memories, that's probably the way in which this closed time uh, we can take to go back and re-experience the nature that we did experience, but rather unconsciously. Maybe very this true. is time for us to consciously experience it. Very true. Very true. Very true. On the flip side, you know, if we start watching films on on that direction, you will <laughs> you will not enjoy the film like you did before. No, <laughs> <laughs> happened with me as well. Right. So Ram and Bindu, you want to add or? I think it's mainly walking and, you know, mm -hmm. stepping out and looking at walking responsibility and responsibly and safely in the environment. I think slowing down and walking and walking as a metaphor to what's happening now right. would uh, make a lot of sense. And uh, that's something that I'm practicing now and I'm also encouraging uh, people to do it. So that 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 would be my uh, note. 
Yes. Gardening right. is the other one, even if it's gardening. gardening. Yes. <laughs> Right. All right. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you. It was a wonderful, uh, you know, conversation. Wonderful talk. Uh, so I think I I landed over to Anusha for the closing note. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Uncle. Um, to formally close the event, I would like to thank all our esteemed guests, uh, Shri Ma'am, Ramnath Sir, and uh, Bindamali Ma'am. I think, like you said rightly, this is this is not the end. This is actually the beginning because we're so glad we're having this conversation. I, I hope this is this is going to be an avenue for uh, many more collaborations, many more awareness projects, because uh, we see even we, we even spoke the policy, right? The government spent right. so much on policy awareness through IEC, BCC, for so many other uh, development sector projects as such. So why not? It's, it's high time for uh, conservation and environment as well. So uh, I hope to end this on a very positive note and uh, thank all of you for uh, being part of this program. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to all the participants as well for patiently being with us. I'm sure they all um, enjoyed uh, the session as well. Thank you. And thank good night you. to everyone. And thank, thank you, you to both, uh, to all three of you today, Uncle um, Anusha and Sanjay, uh, I think it was great to have these momentary interactions and hopefully we'll have longer conversations. And thanks to Surendra Verma Thank and Naveen who uh, had a lot of conversations on and off with me and uh, Surendra Verma largely where we spoke about his experience of the elephant. So thanks much for uh, drawing us into your world. Yeah. Our pleasure, ma'am. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank everybody. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.